following direct voice tape recording is that of Lionel Barrymore, the late American film actor. This was recorded during the year 1957 and it was his second time through to us. The sitters were Mr. S.G. Woods and Mrs. B. Green, medium Mr. Leslie Flint. Good morning. I don't think I've had the pleasure of speaking to you before. Yes, I think you are. You're Lionel Barrymore, aren't you? Yeah, how'd you know that? I didn't tell you. I know. But recognize I, your voice? You recognize my voice. I have your voice on the plate recorder. Well, it sounds like I'm going to speak to you through this box arrangement, you know. Voice box? Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. It's still a lot of strange, and, you know, I suppose eventually I'll be able to manage to talk to you better than this. You but I was very curious what you were just saying about uh, passing over. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, various people have various experiences and their reactions are different according to their personality and character and their knowledge before they come. And uh, I suppose everyone comes through. Well, if they were able to tell you about their experiences and they come here, first of all, they'd all have more or less a different story to tell. For what the play applies to one may not apply to another. Hmm. Personally, I had a little experience this subject before I passed, but I wasn't really convinced. I'd say it with a few mediums, you know, but hmm. uh, at the same time, I had an open mind and I believed in the life after death. Yes. Oh, I met a crowd of people here, people I'd known in the profession, and people that I'd being attached to during life. When did you first pass, what did you find things? Did you find in the world, uh, uh, a world similar to this world? Well, I wouldn't say similar exactly. In certain respects, you might say it was similar as far as nature was concerned, but uh, I certainly didn't see any shops. I didn't see any factories. I didn't see any street cars and automobiles and all that kind of thing. But then again, I understand on lower spheres and the early earth, those things exist. Everything's a matter of state of mind of the people who inhabit that particular place. But when I came here, I remember quite well waking up in a kind of, well, I can only describe it as a beautiful garden. You know, I'm like a garden that I've been very fond of in my youth. And my mother and father were there, and uh, when I opened my eyes, there was my mother just as I remember her when she was a much younger woman. It was a wonderful experience. And then a crowd of other friends came, made themselves known to me, people that I'd known in my earlier years. Strangely enough, you know, it seemed in my first experience that I was meeting people that I'd known way back when I was quite a young lad, you know. Mm -hmm. Whether it is that in some kind of subconscious way my thoughts had always been in my earlier years, because you know, as I began to get older, I had a crotchety leg and mm -hmm. trouble one way and another, mm -hmm. and I often used to sort of daydream back into my youth, you know. Mm -hmm. And I guess as I passed over, my last remaining earthly thoughts were to do with my earlier years. Mm -hmm. And in consequence, it seemed to attract the people around me on this side, that is, that I had known during that period of my life, which was in many ways a very happy one. Mm -hmm. It also may be, I think, possibly that uh, during the closing weeks of my life, those particular people, including my father and mother in particular, came very close to me, which of course would be quite natural. And also I have a dog here that I was very fond of. As anyone told me years ago when I was on earth that animals existed after death, oh, I was pretty broad-minded about these things. I wouldn't have believed that. Because yeah. I never really believed that dogs and cats and, and horses and animals, even though they were our pets, had a sort of soul, although I knew that they had great character and individuality and that they differed very much one from another according to the individual and the people who looked after it and so on. Because I, I have a realization now that we are very much responsible for the animal kingdom, that uh, 
they depend a great deal more on us than we realize. Mm -hmm. And they take something away from us, too, when they leave us, you know. We help them a great deal, more than perhaps we realize. Yes. I don't know if you can hear, you know. Yes, it's just we're very and and hope you can hear me. Yes. I've got a recorder going, so it's all going down. Oh, yeah, you mm -hmm. have a recorder. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, I have my brother John with me. John yes. Barrymore, yes. We oh, never all was hit it off on earth, but we get on very well here. Good. How do you spend your life on that side? What do you do? Well, I'm still interested in the theatre, and we do have entertainment, I suppose you call it, although in a way it's not exactly that. Everything we do here has a motive, has a purpose. Every play that's produced and everything that is achieved or done here has a real purpose, not only just to give people pleasure and entertain them, which of course they do, but uh, there's a morale in everything that we do, you know. Mm -hmm. For instance, we take down kind of uh, plays that you'd call plays, morality plays more perhaps, but by that I don't mean to say that down and boring. They're very entertaining and very interesting, and we take them down into the law spheres and reproduce the lives of certain individuals that we may perhaps see in the audience. And we can read their auras and we know exactly their lives and why they're in that particular condition. So we perhaps will portray excerpts from the lives of individuals. And only the person there will know that it's his life that's being portrayed. But in so doing, it helps that person to see themselves as they really are. And in consequence, they... Uh, begin to think more deeply and it helps them to sort of uh, sort themselves out and desire a better existence. That's a good psychological... Sure, effect, that's what the sort it? of thing that we do. Yeah. Everything we do here must be done from the heart. It must be sincere. Yeah. And uh, if ever we do a play such as I've been trying to explain to you, we, we do it with the hope that it will help someone to rise above themselves. We try and point out why they're in that situation in which they find themselves. And we also give an added uh, fill-up, you might say, to it by also portraying certain aspects of our own life which they could have and achieve if they set about doing it. Everything we do here, there's a reason. Nothing is done just idly. We do everything that has purpose and point to it, especially in regard to the theater, which I'm discussing now. I've met Flo Ziegfeld and a crowd of others here who still produce plays and still produce what you'd call a kind of extravaganza. Mm -hmm. At least that's the word we used to mm -hmm. have for it in the States, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't, by that, I don't necessarily mean to say a kind of folies bergere. I don't mean that exactly, but women do play parts and they do you see over here you've got to realize that we have no sort of false uh, ideas about uh, one's uh, appearance and one's clothing and all lack of it here we are completely and absolutely free of all the old things on earth that sort of well made us rather perhaps high bound or narrow minded here we treat nature in the true sense, in the right way. Here, we are very conscious of the great uh, gifts that have been bestowed upon us in every sense, in every way. And all types of people here find all sorts of interesting work to do. And uh, there are some here that uh, create beautiful clothes, design. Others who design beautiful pictures, or perhaps it may be scenery even that they create for our plays. There are others who uh, compose great music. I've, I've heard music here which is far removed from anything you've ever heard on earth. Orchestras numbering several hundreds of people, and each one an artist in his own way, in his own right. Here are some of the great composers who compose new works, so magnificent that I couldn't even begin to tell you how magnificent the sound is. And you know that even in their work, there's a great reason and purpose. You know, as they're playing their great works here, you can see in the atmosphere mm -hmm. all changing lights and colors. I've read that. It's the most magnificent sight. Mm. Oh, I could go on telling you all kinds of things. Well, it's very interesting. It's very interesting. And, uh, what sort of places are they? What are the places like? Are they like the theatres on Earth? Yeah, some are very like theatres on Earth and some are far removed. 
Because what I got to explain to you is, when well, we have what you would term a kind of theater, very like uh, you see on earth with uh, beautiful seating and carpeting and uh, auditorium beautifully appointed and all that kind of thing. Also, we have great open air amphitheaters, I suppose you'd call them, in the natural surroundings. Here are produced all kinds of plays, great plays from the earliest times, men and women here who have made an art of writing and producing and acting. Mm -hmm. I mean, for instance, all the great plays of Shakespeare are produced here. And what is more interesting still, newer plays, greater plays, much greater plays than any that you know of on earth. He's still writing and still producing and acting too. So is Spencer and so are all the great ones here. Do they still write in the same style that they did in those days? No, no. The style, naturally, as one advances, as one gains more experience in a new existence, naturally your style changes. Mm -hmm. The same as I suppose if Shakespeare could have lived to have been 500 years old, shall we say, mm -hmm. on earth, he would have naturally altered his way of writing and he would have changed in many respects according to the time in which he lived. Mm -hmm. If he were living today, he'd write great plays as he does here on this side. But of course, they'd be in the modern idiom. They'd be in uh, the way of thought and the way of action as you expect them to be and would appreciate them. But no doubt, of course, about it that he would have written a far greater stuff than anything that any modern writer would have written. Mm -hmm. I mean, for instance, I go around now, sometimes I come back to Earth and I go around to your theatres and I watch the acting and the plays and with a few exceptions, most of it's pretty bad, mm -hmm. I say, anyway. Have you met uh, Shakespeare? Or I've met Shakespeare and I can sit the argument once for all, there's no doubt about it, he wrote his own plays. <laughs> You don't want to worry about that. That doesn't yeah. mean to say that he didn't steal, yeah. which is common among uh, artists of all ranks. Yes. He didn't steal ideas from others, that he didn't even sometimes use old plays and refurbish them, you know, and rewrite yeah. them. There's no doubt about that, but you can take it from me that what you hear with Shakespeare plays Shakespeare's. Yeah. Have you met any famous singers there at that time? Sure, I've met many and many a famous singer here. Kathleen Ferry, have you met her? Kathleen Ferry, you mean? Ferry, yes. Uh, you're the English um, uh, yes. lady who passed some years ago. Yeah, I sure I've met her. She's a magnificent soul. Yes. And she had a wonderful voice. You know, half of her charm was not only her voice, but her personality yes. and character. I it came like out that. in her voice. Yeah. I've yes. listened to many a great artist when on earth but I've known them to be like wildcats backstage, uh, quite different to their voice. But this one you're talking about was quite different. Mm -hmm. Yes, lovely voice I think she had. I hope, you I have to excuse me for a moment. Yeah. Hold on. We're holding on with you. He's very good, isn't he? he is. Hello? Hello. Sorry to have to break away like that. Quite all right. Uh, it's quite an effort to talk at length. Oh, I've got it too, you? Yes. Yes. Anyway, yes. I'll come and speak to you again some other time. Oh, good. That's very nice. And I'm yes. very glad to meet people like yourselves who are very sincerely interested in the philosophy and the things that really matter in this great mm, truth. Yes. One of the reasons yes. why I don't come back very often is I get fed up with these people who are all the while asking to talk to Fanny and Charlie. I realize you're going to have proof and evidence in the beginning but some of these people go on and on never seem to be satisfied. That's what we call an Aunt Fanny session. Ah, uh, well, you don't want that. No. no. Well, at least I realize You want something important. that we can give these recordings to teach others. Well, well, you can play these recordings to your friends and those are interested. And yes. I can say with all sincerity that if they seek, they shall truly find. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. Be with you. Goodbye. Thank you, Mr. Barrymore. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming through.
Facebook of the world. Nice.